Hello, business analytics class. This is going to be our um, uh, video content on uh, neural networks. Um, the way that we're going to handle this um, is going to be similar and different to the past um, uh, video lectures. This one, we're pretty much just going to do the in-class exercise. Um, it'll be on you to look at the PowerPoint slides and walk through those. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave that on you. We'll cover some of this material more um, uh, when we look to the final exam review, and I'll kind of clue you into some of the concepts that you'll need to know more about um, for the test. Um, but I think in preparation for Wednesday's lab, um, it will be enough to uh, run through the slides on your own. Just have sort of a high level. Um, a high level uh, understanding and when I say high level I mean a very high level like so don't don't worry about digging too much into the weeds of um, uh, really the technology uh, piece um, from the slides um, or the the kind of theoretical mathematics of the slides there's um, talk about the hyperbolic tangent and a linear function and a, and a Gaussian function and it's just it's just beyond the scope so it's it's beyond the scope from a knowing how to use a tool standpoint right so one of the things that we do in this class is we want to understand um, we want to understand what it is that the tool that we're using can accomplish and then we also want to understand how to use that tool and then we want to understand how do we interpret the output of that tool so we we learn about a particular tool we learn how to use that tool and use it within the software and then we learn how to um, to interpret the output okay so I, I think in a business analytics class um, for business majors it's not important that we get into um, a lot of the kind of theoretical mathematics or applied uh, the theoretical mathematics behind kind of the application into technology um, that is kind of running under the surface with this it's just it's just not necessary at this point so that being said um, that's nice for you in this regard because this is just going to be um, in class exercise video right so we're going to step by step kind of in a recipe format um, as we have before walk through um, our in class um, assignment which is going to closely relate to how the lab um, functions and it gives you a really good primer for um, working on the lab so this is how we're going to handle this so let's go ahead and get started so in class exercise neural networks let's just read through it so data mining step one develop a business research question or goal so this is um, following our stepwise format in the same way that we have for the last uh, large number of labs the issue of granting loans to loan applicants has been a problem that microfinance companies in developing countries have been trying to overcome uh, overcome over the years. This is since losses that companies incur are largely to, due to default of these loans and others since they are unable to pay the loans on time. To grant a loan, it is necessary on the part of the institution to assess the risk of default of payment by the borrower or borrowers. Financial risk can be defined, uh, divided into credit, market, operational, but the largest component is credit risk. By developing an accurate credit risk uh, rating system, banks will be able to identify loans that have lower probability of default versus loans that have a higher probability of default. Business goal. This uh, assessment of the customer is based on the bank's ability to collect data on the customer's credit history, such as income level, age, number of years of education, and so on, as well as the expected profitability of the project. The company can uh, then assess these data uh, before loan is granted to a borrower. Uh, the goal, of, so the analytics goal, the goal of the study is to understand the characteristics of customers who are most likely to default on a loan. The setting is a large bank in the European Union. The target value is credit risk. This is a 0 to 1 binary response variable where 0 is good risk and 1 is bad risk. After completing the tasks in the exercise, you should be able to explore and gain understanding of the risk data, build a neural network, 
identify important variables in predicting risk under or using the prediction profiler, um, interpret explanatory power, predictive power, and misclassification rate. Okay, a lot of this, uh, should I say a lot of this? Um, some of this we've done before, right? The use of the prediction profiler. Um, and uh, this is that's just where we stick in a bunch of um, values for the variables that we have, and it spits us out um, a number at the end, usually a probability of success or failure of our categorical um, dependent variable at the end. And then our interpret the explanatory power, predictive power, you know, that's our our accuracy and misclassification rates that we use when we do the the um, the confusion matrix okay all right so data mining step two obtain the data the data file consists of 46,500 customer records um, and you'll see that this is going to affect um, the processing speed of how long um, it takes our computer to run through the neural network analysis um, the response variable of interest is risk, which takes two values. The potential predictors are listed in table one. Uh, download the set credit risk from um, a credit risk that jump from Brightspace and open this file in jump. All right, so go ahead and do that or pause the video and do that. Um, I believe I have already done it. So, you know, I won't show you the process of going on to um, going on to Brightspace and doing that. So go ahead, pause and do that. All right, data mining step three, pre-processing of the data instructions. Uh, download the data uh, to your computer. Um, launch jump and open the file. Compare the data types of the variables in table one with the uploaded uh, jump file. Make necessary changes um, to the data type on the jump file as per table one. All right, so we're going to go ahead and do that. So um, looking here at table one, hopefully you have this printed off and you can... Um, look at this as I look at this um, because what I'm going to be doing is just looking at my printout of this and then looking at the jump file to compare what we have here okay so I'm not going to cycle back and forth in the video um, between this document and jump you should be looking at this document as well as I'm looking at this document off screen while we look at jump here okay so credit risk so now we are at jump and it is asking us uh, the details from the variables in the data file. Um, look at this table and make sure everything in jump matches what we have in this table um, from a nominal continuous standpoint. Okay, so in this you see that we give you the um, nominal and continuous. We just want to make sure that our file is accurate. Okay, and it looks like I have some of this stuff done already. Okay, give me one second as I pause. Okay, I'm back. All right, um, so let's look here. So I'm looking at the table, risk, good risk, bad risk. That's going to be nominal. It shows on our um, columns here that it is, in fact, nominal. I'm just going to march down the list um, on our sheet as that, I think, is, for the most part, in alphabetical order. Yeah, it's in alphabetical order except for the dependent variable. So the dependent variable is listed at the top in risk and then all of the independent variables are then listed below it alphabetically but that's not true of what we see on screen here okay so I'm just gonna go through the list on here so age should be continuous we look and we find age yes it's continuous bureau continuous it is continuous car type is supposed to be uh, nominal and I guess let's also talk about like what these mean. So the bureau we just looked at was low risk to high risk um, on a number scale. And um, uh, car was just the type of the vehicle. Cards, the credit card uh, type used by the user, that's going to be Visa, MasterCard, that sort of thing. That should be nominal. So that's going to be listed as cards, and that is nominal. Cash should be the uh, requested cash loan amount, so that should be continuous, and it is. Children um, would be the number of children in a household, and that is continuous, obviously. Um, EC card, this is whether or not they're a EC card holder. Okay, and that is nominal, and it is as such here. 
Um, thin loan, it's just yes or no. Have they finished paying off previous loans? And so that should just be nominal. That should be a yes or no, and that is. Uh, income should be continuous. Um, it is. Loans, uh, number of loans outside of the bank should be continuous, obviously. And why am I not seeing that? Loans, it is. Um, nationality should be nominal. It is. Nat. Number of loans um, should be continuous, and it is. Um, number of persons per household should be continuous, and it is. Um, the product should be nominal. Um, that's the type of credit card product that they're using. Um, their profession should obviously be nominal. And it is prof. And uh, resident uh, type should be nominal, and it is. And then time add and time, TM add and TM job one. So it's time at current address in months and then time at current job in months. And those should be continuous and they both are. Okay, so that's that. So we've done that. So now we do this, um, you know, the thing that we do in every single lab where we analyze the variables and we just make sure that there's no like outliers that, um, so like we make sure that there's no outliers that shouldn't be in the data, right? So there's, so there's sometimes outliers, but sometimes it just makes sense that there is an outlier. You know, it's just, there's nothing wrong with it. It just is outside of the norm. So we go here and we analyze our distribution. So I just grab all of the variables and put them into Y and run it. Okay, and it's going to pull up this whole distribution. I always go and I stack them so that it's um, up and down. Uh, makes it fit into the video screen um, more nicely as well. Um, and we just run through this, and I'm actually not going to walk through this portion of the video. This is something we've done a million times, so I'll let you guys do this. So just run through these variables and make sure everything is kosher. Um, wow, we have somebody with a huge income here. Let's see. An income of 100000 That doesn't seem all that much. Interesting. It, oh, that's a, but income is defined as a weekly income. So they make 100000 a week. All right, well, that's, uh, <laughs> that is a little bit of an outlier. Now, should that, should we take that out? I don't, I don't think so. Um, we could actually go and we could look at that individual and see maybe what their profession is and see if that makes sense. So I'll leave that up to you if you would like to go do that. All right, so just look at our variables here. I'll let you guys go ahead and do that. I know we've done that a million times, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time doing that because I don't want this video to run super long. I want to keep it to 30 or 40 minutes, especially because we've got a lot of stuff with new concepts that we need to cover. All right. Oh, so I should have kept that up because in our... Um, and sorry if you guys can hear the garbage truck outside behind me. <laughs> the garbage is coming rather late in the day. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and redo this again just so that we can answer some of our questions. So I'm not going to, like, look into um, the outliers too much, but we can look into some of these questions. So the first question is, what percentage of the customers are a bad risk? So we can look here, 0.03226, so 3.226%. On average, how many years has a customer been at their current job? So what variable is that? Um, time at current job in months. Okay. So we go all the way down to TM job one. We can find it. There it is. All right, so TM job one. So it is asking for on average, how many years has a customer been in their current job? So on. So we have a mean here, which is 84.4. That is in months. So if we wanted that in years, we, you would just take that number and you would divide it by 12. So 83.4, um, um, you know, 84 divided by 12 would be seven years. So it's going to be like a 6.9 sort of number. Okay. What is the median age of customers? All right. So we have to find our age variable, which is just called age. The median age, do we see it here? Yes, we do. Median age is 35. Okay, um, how many customers have no loans with the bank? 
All right, so that is going to be um, what number of loans with banks? So NMB loan variable. So how many customers have no loans with the bank? Um, so we would look at the number of loans with bank. And the one thing that you'll notice is it doesn't have the count option. So Jump doesn't do well counting the data. Um, Jump doesn't do well counting the data when it is a continuous variable. So what you could do is you could go, um, you could go change this to a categorical variable, and then it will just very easily um, count them. Um, or you could just click this, the number of zeros, okay, and then just move this over and see how many cells it selects. So it would be 30,988. Okay. So like I said, if this were labeled as a um, categorical variable, it would just very easily just give us a frequency here and just count it. Okay. So yeah, so just go ahead and click that bar, that representing the zero loans, and then you just look at how many it's counting within the data. Okay. Cool, 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 cool. All right, um, and then E, what is the probability that a randomly selected customer is German? Okay, so what variable is that going to be? So we scroll down to NAT, and what does it say? What is the probability that a randomly selected customer is German? And then we just look at German, and then the probability, and we see that it's 0.83508. Okay, so then that concludes number two, and then we're going to move on to getting into... Um, some more kind of exploratory stuff. Okay, so in your lab, I mean, it doesn't call us to do this on here, but in your lab, you'd go ahead and you would um, save the script to the data table and, you know, name it something that's conducive to um, whatever we got going on, you know, so, um, you know, name it something conducive to either the number of the step or the type of uh, um, thing that you're doing or the step in the data mining process that you're in something that you know makes it easier on you all right so number three perform a contingency analysis and test whether there is significant relationship between fin loan um, which fin loan was have they finished paying off uh, previous loans or not and risk or um, cards which is the credit card type um, used by the customer and their risk, okay? So we're going to be doing two different contingency tables, and we want to test um, whether or not um, there is significance there, whether or not there is a relationship. So this um, sort of um, categorical relationship, so it's a one categor uh, categorical variable to one other categor categorical variable, sorry for mincing over my words. Um, this is going to be the chi-squared test. This is going to be the mosaic plot. Um, um, this is going to be something that, you know, we've obviously seen a ton of before. So let's go ahead and do that. So this is also just done fit y by x. So jump automatically knows that because we're using um, two categorical variables, as evidenced by this diagram here, that it's going to run us a contingency table. All right. So we'll put our risk in the Y because that's what this, this lab is all about, is determining customer risk. And then we'll put fin loan. So have they finished paying the loan off, yes or no, into the X and we hit OK and it runs everything for us, which is nice. Okay, so as always, we use um, our Pearson chi-squared test to answer the question of is there a significant relationship or not. We're always looking for a very low p-value, you know, specifically below some alpha value that you know we just kind of generally assume is five percent so this is a very low p value so we can see that yes there is a relationship here okay so that that's enough right like that's enough to like kind of answer the question but like what we actually want to do because i think visually it's not obvious that there's a relationship here usually visually we want to see some some um shift in this mosaic plot we want to see some difference in the probability of um, one of these characteristics, okay? Why then is the test telling us that there is significance when we don't exactly see that in the data? 
So I think this mosaic plot is a lot better for when we have like a smaller set of data. So if you remember, and as you can see here in the corner, we've got 40 th 46th? <laughs> 46,500 pieces of data. Okay. And so when you have that much data, the chi-squared test is even going to pick up the slightest of shifts in probability. And because we have such a large sample size, those shifts are going to be significant, even if they're not like structurally all that big, right? But it's because we have such a large sample size, we're very sure of that difference in probability. So if we want to see that difference in probability, we go ahead and we look at this contingency table and we want to kind of cut some of the fat here. So we get rid of count because that's just, um, that's going to be our, just like our, um, our hard data frequencies. Right? So we get rid of that. We get rid of total percentage because we're not really concerned with the total percentage. Um, what we are concerned with is what changes about the probability of good risk and bad risk when we go from um, somebody who has a loan, a loan outstanding, or somebody who has paid off their loan. So we want to get rid of our column percentage too because it is not as important to see the difference in um, uh, the changing of good, good risk versus bad risk um, uh, when it comes to evaluating the row. Okay, So what we want here is just to leave the row percentage. So then we look and we say for somebody with fin loan equal to zero, which is to say um, fin, fin, have they finished paying off their loans? So no would be they've finished they've not finished paying off their loans. And yes, one, they have finished paying off their loans. These are the probabilities of them being a good risk or a bad risk, right? And so we see exactly what we see in this table here uh, in, in our mosaic plot as we do in this table here. So when somebody has not finished paying off their loans, the the um, probability of them being a bad risk, a bad credit risk, meaning they would have a higher likelihood of default if we extended them a loan is 3.63%, okay? Whereas if they have paid off all their loans, their probability of being a bad risk is 2.84%. So, you know, 80 basis points lower, 79 basis points lower, okay? So while that, like on the whole, is not a huge number, it is significant, meaning it's there, like it's actually true, because there is a difference and because we have a large sample size. So our chi-squared test that we run is actually catching that, right? Whereas if we had 50, if we had, you know, n equal 50 for the number of data points here, this sort of risk would assuredly not be significant right uh, or sorry this sort of um this sort of difference in probabilities amongst the risks would assuredly not be significant because this is testing do we think that there is actually a difference there and and, and the size of the difference isn't important right it's do we think that there is actually a difference between the two and because we have so much data we are and because there is this small difference we are very sure that that small dis small difference actually does exist okay all right so this kind of speaks to a lot of what we covered in statistics in that like you're taking um you're taking a sample and you're making a statistical inference about a population and that's that's you know this the whole point here so anyways yeah so all this to say right it's good enough for you to look at this pearson um chi-squared um uh statistic to tell whether the test is, is significant but if you want to look uh, and and actually kind of understand what's going on you want to carve away some of the fat from the contingency table that it probably will give you right off the rip and you want to look into well what is the change between zero and one and how does that affect whether somebody is a good or bad risk okay all right but i did want to explain because on like on the surface you look at that mosaic plot and they just don't look that different right and, and they're not that different but the small difference that they have is significant in Israel, and that's what um, we're seeing with the significance from our chi-squared test, okay? So that's that. Um, so we did that. So on a normal lab, you'd go in and you'd save the script, and I would name it something like 3A, right, because we're on step 3, and we just ran our first test. So we say 3A, we jump out of this, and we go, we want to run our second test, and we put risk here 
And then our next variable, which is the number of cards. So cards, throw that into the X and we hit OK. And it runs something again, right? So let's just do the exact same thing that we did beforehand. So I'm going to cut some of the fat out of this contingency table. And it's actually going to help everything to fit in the screen, I think, too. So I cut everything out. And now we've just got the row percentage, which the row percentage is going to give us the difference in probability of good risk versus bad risk um, from the different types of cards that they hold. All right. And then also we still have our same chi-squared test. That doesn't this the chi-squared test doesn't change when we just um, change the what we're viewing of probabilities in the contingency table. That that's not changing. Okay. But we also see from our Pearson chi-squared statistic that it is low. So that's good. So it's significant, all right? And now you can see from the sample of 46,500 that we do have some differences in the probabilities of good risk versus bad risk, given the different types of credit cards that people hold, okay? So you can take a second and look to that to understand that, and um, that's that. All right. So I'd go ahead and save that. 3B. So that's good to know. And on to step four. Um, generate the correlation matrix for all continuous variables. All right, so let's first do that. So that is what? That is going to be analyze multivariate methods, multivariate. Okay, and then we just want to pull in all of our continuous stuff. And that is all of them. So we hit OK. And it runs this, it runs a correlation matrix, it runs the scatter plot matrix, and we'll probably have to pull some other stuff out here as well. So generate the correlation matrix for all of the continuous variables. Check, we've done that. A, which pairwise correlations are significant um, at alpha level 0.05? Are there any of the correlations that are not significant? List them all here. All right. And this is just talking specifically about the ones that are not significant, all right, because there are a ton that, if I remember correctly, there are a ton pairwise correlations. There are a ton that are not significant are, or that are significant. So we just want to list the ones that are not significant. And you can kind of just look and see here what we got going on from a significant standpoint. We've got a ton that are significant, right? So then you would just want to list the ones that are not significant. So how do we do that? Um, I mean, we could see them easily here, but what you could always do is sort this and go call, go to sort by column and then um, sort ascending, or actually we'll sort descending on Signif probability, so that's the probability of them being um, significant. And we see that loans versus age are not significant with a five percent um, or with a five percent alpha level, and um, age and children are not significant. Okay, so that's what you would list there. Uh, like I said, if there's just a ton of ones that are significant, I I don't think you need to list all of that there. Okay, all right. Um, and then B, which of the significant correlations um, are positively correlated? Are any of them negatively um, or inversely correlated? So um, you can go and you can sort on the correlation column. If my, yeah, if this wants to work, um, we just sort by the correlation and We'll do that descending, so then it'll start with all of the uh, positive correlations on the top. We say a lot of stuff positively correlated. We can scroll down and see a lot of stuff negatively correlated. That's that. Um, and you can list whatever you would like to list there. And then it says, if you were to use these variables to predict risk, which pairs of independent variables might create issues with multicollinearity. Okay, list the three pairs of variables which are most strongly related to each other and their correlation coefficient. All right, so this 
concept from a structural stand or from a from a what do I need to do standpoint is you need to find the top three comparisons, right? So we've already kind of listed that out. We have persons per household and children, time on the job, age, and uh, time at an address and age. Okay. And then these would be our top correlations. These are our strongest positive correlations. So let's so that's what you would list. You'd list persons and household, children, and then the correlation for R. All right. So that's that's enough for you to like move on from that step. But we need to talk about what multicollinearity is. Um, if you remember, we worked on this with our. Um, we first saw this, I believe, in um, our regression um, section. So simple. Um, uh, linear regression and multiple linear regression. And multicollinearity is the concept that you have um, continuous independent variables. So specifically with your independent variables that are continuous, um, these are supposed to be then working to predict our continuous dependent variable, right? So you have a continuous dependent variable, you have a list, a slew of um, continuous independent variables, and what you don't want to have happen, or what multicollinearity is, is the issue of our independent, quote-unquote, independent variables being correlated with one, one another. Okay, the reason why this is an issue is that when you go to attribute um, uh, the R squared or like how important a specific variable is to the prediction of the dependent variable, what you end up having is you end up undercounting how important a specific variable it is uh, is to predicting that dependent variable because it's splitting its credit with another one of the independent variables, right? So what we see here specifically in this example is the variable persons per household and children are unbelievably highly strongly correlated, right? But that makes complete sense, okay? It, all it's saying is you're assuming that, or all that's really happening is that the number of children that somebody has is probably possibly, positively going to correlate with the number of people living in that household, right? So most of the time, and like obviously not all of the time, but most of the time, um, you know, like the number of people living in the household is going to match up with like the parent or parents plus children, you know, just that mathematical equation. So that's why we see them so highly correlated. So multicollinearity would suggest that if we were to use both of those variables together when we were running a regression or whether we're running some sort of model, when we go to find um, what variables are significant in the model, those variables would be overrepresented and they would be s splitting the significance. So they would both come off looking like they weren't that important in, to the model, yet they're both very important to the model, but the problem is, is they're related to one another. So they end up splitting all the credit for explaining away the dependent variable. So the way that we look at this and the, we look into multicollinearity, there's, there's, a, there's a variance inflation factor called VIF that we used before that you can that specifically measures multicollinearity. I'm not going to make you look into VIF right now. We're just going to look at a strong correlation and, and know that that has the potential for multicollinearity. Okay. So what do we do about it? Eventually what we want to do is we just want to pick a variable and go with it. Right. So like we want to go with um, either children or either persons living in the household, okay? And from a, I mean, you really want to use just kind of your your logic, right? Like, which one do you want to pick? You don't want both of them in there. And you don't want to, like, take both of them out because they're clearly going to be, you know, they're potentially important. Um, but I don't know. I, I would probably take out children um, when we eventually go to run the model and probably leave persons living in the household in um, because... I think having an effect on whether somebody pays a loan back or not is going to be more contingent on the amount of money that they have. And then thus, it's going to be more contingent on the number of mouths that they have to feed. So um, you could view that as children. You could also view that as people living in the household. You know, maybe a parent lives in a household, uh, you know, a grandparent or something like that. So like, 
it's but it's up to you, right? Like you have to make that call. So you're going to just end up only using one of those variables. Um, that being said, so now the next line we have time on the job and age and time uh, um, at the address and age. Yeah, those are in the top three of correlations, but they're not so highly correlated that I think multicollinearity is going to be an issue. So I wouldn't take either one of those out. Okay, so that's that. So let's get on to it. After that rant about um, what multicollinearity is, but hopefully that makes some sense. Basically, you just don't want two independent variables that are related to one another to be in the model that are that are too related to one another to be in the model because they're going to share in the credit and look like they ex they're explaining you know half the variation that they actually are explaining, but it's just because they're so closely related. Okay, alrighty. Um, so that's that. So now we're on to data mining step four. So I'll go ahead and save what I need to save. Um, and make sure you have handy, um, or yeah, just make sure you're thinking about what you're going to end up taking out of, of the model when, when it comes to it. So I'll just save that as multivariate or 4B or something like that. Either way, it doesn't matter. Um, all right, so step four, create a neural network using all variables except any that may have multicollinearity as identified in step four. Risk um, is the dependent variable, which we have already, uh, you know, established. Um, use two hidden layers and three nodes for the tan hyperbolic activation. Um, one node for linear, one node for Gaussian in each layer, and then hold back validation method with one third of data as hold back. Okay, so you don't know what any of that means, but well, you might know what some of that means if you read the notes. So that would be the the positive to going through the uh, PowerPoint slides if you like. But like I said, you just really need to know what's going on on a high level. You know, what does the tool do? That sort of thing. And so a lot of this mathematical back end, it's fine to just accept it for what it is and to um, use it as a tool. All right, so let's create the neural network. So go to Analyze, Predictive Modeling, Neural, okay. And our risk is our dependent variable, obviously. So that goes there. And we want every other variable into the Y or into the X, except for whichever one you decide to take out. So children or persons uh, in the household. So I'll take out children. Okay. All right. So then we hit OK. All right. It's going to bring up this menu, and then it talks about these sorts of things. Um, yep, it talks about these sorts of things that we want to cover. So, um, first layer, so we want to do 311. This is what it's talking about when it says three nodes for, tan, um, uh, for um, tangential hyperbolic. And... Um, one for linear and one for Gaussian. We want to do that as well here. Okay. Okay, and then it says holdback validation method with one third of the data as holdback. So this is just um, us creating a validation column within the tool. So one third as holdback. So that's what, what we have there. We just hit okay. We just leave everything else as is. We just hit okay. Or we hit go, sorry. So once we've hit go, it's going to bring up a little fit here. Oh, there it is. And it takes a few seconds to run it. So hopefully it doesn't run for too long. But all right, so it says, so first of all, we want to then bring up the diagram. Yours might do it on its own. My, um, mine is not. So we go to our red arrow. And we click on diagram, and it's going to bring up the diagram that we see here in the in-class lab. So that's kind of cool. And then it says save your validation column to the table. And we go here, and we save validation column. So then it's going to throw that validation column into our table. Don't mind the dots that it has. <clears throat> and then so we have all this now. So we've run our neural, um, our neural network. It says, look at the confusion matrices. Um, 
sorry. Look at the confusion matrices and analyze them for the validation set. So we have our validation set over here, and we're going to run um, some analysis on the validation set. What percentage of the variation risk is explained by the model? So this is what our generalized R square is going to give us. So we look at our R square. So um, our variation risk is um, right here, 14.5%. So 0.1453792. Numbers might de be different on yours, um, just based upon um, how the system calculates the validation column and whatnot. Okay, Cal you calculate your accuracy rate for the validation. So we'd go down to the um, confusion matrix, and remember the accuracy rate is just going to be the uh, uh, true positives plus the true negatives divided by everything. So it would be our 11,699 plus um, 62 all over 11,699 plus 0 plus 335 plus 62. So our, our predicted good risk, um, actually good risk, predicted bad risk, actually bad risk, all over the total. Our, mis our misclassification rate is just going to be 1 minus that, or um, 0 plus 335 divided by the total. Okay. And what else? Which type of error is worse for the for the bank? A false positive or a false negative? Explain. Okay, so this is where you have to kind of use some of your business knowledge, right? Um, and this is kind of a, an application question. It's not like a look at the output type of question. All right, so thinking about a loan, how much money does a bank make off of a loan? So meaning what do they make? So they make interest, right? So they're going to be making, um, you know, say 4% or whatever, you know, think of, think of a number, 6% on a loan, taking over the life of the loan. Okay. That's the money that they're going to be, they're going to make, they're going to get their money that, um, that's paid back to them. And then they're going to win on the interest that they make off of you. All right. So that's the way that the bank would, would win. That's their, that's good risk. Their bad risk is, what they stand to lose, what they, um, what, what, what do they lose? They don't lose interest, right? What they lose is the principal amount of the loan. So they, they lose the whole amount of the loan that you don't pay off. So when a bank is going to, um, going to give out a loan, like they want a strong idea of a good risk versus a bad risk because the bad risk has, considerably more negative consequences than the good risk does, right? You know, you want to be really sure um, that you're taking a good risk um, and really sure that you're not taking a bad risk because the bad risk is potentially, you know, disastrous, whereas the good risk, you're earning 6% or something like that, okay? So my, uh, my analysis on this would be um, you would rather... What is worse is that they would falsely, uh, that they would have a false positive, meaning they would identify something as a positive that's actually not a positive, right? So that would be more catastrophic because you would say, oh, yes, we're going to pass this person through, but they're actually a bad risk of default, right? So a false positive in this regard, I think, would be worse, okay? So that's something to think about. Um, but, but again, that's more of a business question. Um, than it is a jump output sort of question. Okay, so we move on to step eight. Identify the top five variables um, that are potential predictors for the risk for this uh, from the summary report. Then it says variable summary importance summary uh, report. Variable summary importance summary report by using um, access variable importance option. I'll edit that um, before you guys see this. Um, independent um, uniform inputs under the red triangle attached to the prediction profiler. Okay, so we go to our model. We grab prediction profiler, so profiler. It has this prediction profiler running all the way out. We go to our red triangle, and we want to say access variable importance, and then independent uniform inputs. Okay. And then it gives us this um, a report. So we're looking at overall 
um, total effect here. Okay, identify the top five variables that are potential predictors for the risk. So that our top five variables would be um, uh, NAT, prof, cards, income, and cash. Okay, so those are the top five predictors of risk. All right, so we turn to the next page, so that was eight. Rerun the neural network model with the top five, predict for, top five predictors identified above. Did the model perform better? <clears throat> okay, um, so let's do that. So I'm going to go ahead and save this script so that we have it. And save it to the data table. We'll just call it neural network, so NN1. Okay. I'll X out of here, so let's run the neural network again. Analyze predictive modeling neural network and risk up here, and we're only going to use those top five variables, which hopefully you wrote down. Um, I did, so no worries. Income, cards, NAT, prof, which is profession, and number of children. Interesting. Did I use number of children last time? I thought that that's. I thought I didn't, but okay. Oh well. well you can rewind and and see. All right. So, yes. So let's run this. So we hit OK. It's going to give us those same options, and we do the same three one one. Three one one. We hit go, and then it's going to take some time. Probably a little bit less time because we have less variables. That it's going to run through. And it did. And it says, do, did the model uh, perform better? Okay. And this is specifically you, uh, put, specifically asking you the question, did, so did it perform better? Meaning, is it explaining this uh, a better amount of variation in the risk, in the dependent variable that we're looking at? So we just look, again, look at our generalized R square. Okay. And we see that this now had... 5% explain. Whereas I think last time, if we look at NN1, oh, it's going to rerun it. Amazing, amazing. All right. Last time I think it was like 14%. 9%. Okay. So we see here with our validation. Um, nine percent so the first one is better you know that's uh, that's that's what we find okay and so hopefully I didn't lose this nice I didn't okay and so now um, um, we are going to then run uh, data mining step six to see if the model or to, to test out the model, and that is where we use our prediction profiler. So using the profiler tool, predict the probability of whether the falling customer will be a bad risk. List the probability below. So let's run um, our neural network, which I just X'd out of, which is killing me. So you'll have to wait another 15 seconds. And so we run that neural network, and then we're going to pull up um, our prediction profiler. We're going to plug these numbers in and see what happens, okay? All right, so we got our prediction profiler. So the age of this person, oh boy, you guys can't see this because of my screen, so I'll do my best here. So the age of this person is 35, but you guys know how to do this, so that's fine. So we put in 35 for their age. Um, their bureau, which I am looking for, we look for bureau number two. Well, I'm doing number two in bureau off screen, so you guys know how to do it. Well, basically, yeah, you guys know how to do the prediction profiler. You're basically taking all of the information that it's giving you, and you're just plugging it in um, to this until it spits you out a probability of good risk or bad risk, given those characteristics, okay? So I'll let you guys go ahead and do that. Like I said, you know how to do the prediction profiler. We've done this a, a million times. 
Um, I mean, never with this many variables before, but it functions the same way. You just walk down through the list, you put in these variables in, or you um, change, you know, you click along the graph to change through categorical variables, that sort of thing, whenever you need to change something. And that's that, okay? All right, guys. Well, what else do we have here? All right, well, yeah, I think that's it. So you guys have done this. The last page is just a picture of the prediction profiler. Please, please, please let me know if you have any questions, um, either prior to when studying this or um, tomorrow in lab. Um, but hopefully this was helpful to you for the walkthrough. Again, you'll want to have just like briefly looked over the um, slides to kind of just understand what a neural network is. Um, what else? And yeah, like I said, we'll cover some more of what you need to know for like an exam. Um, kind of as we get closer to the exam. All right. All right, guys. Uh, thanks so much. Hopefully you are um, liking and finding these videos informative. All right. So I will see you in class tomorrow. All right. Bye-bye.